Welcome, everybody. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. Welcome to our service this morning. Our opening song is our beloved Jennifer McMillan playing a hymn that isn't one of our most frequent, but I think you'll recognize the tune when she starts to play. Number 335, Once When My Heart Was Passion Free. Once when my heart was passion free to learn of things As we begin our service this morning, we acknowledge and express our gratitude that our Westwood building and many of us are gathered here today are situated on Treaty 6 territory. Recognition of traditional lands is an important first step in examining what we can do to actively honor the 94 calls to action in the Commission of Canada Truth and Reconciliation Report. Welcome to Westwood Unitarian Congregation, a welcoming community that embraces a free and meaningful search for truth. We search for truth everywhere, but some of our named sources include the teachings of earth-based religions, words and deeds of prophetic women and men, and wisdom from the world's religions. But first and foremost, our own direct experience is our primary source. Each of us is our own authority. My name is Lisa Stein and I am your service leader today. Our speaker is Reverend Ann Barker delivering her final sermon before knee replacement surgery this week. Yay. We wish Ann well over the next two months and also wish her a speedy and worry-free recovery. Our musicians this morning are Jennifer McMillan and Rebecca Patterson. Tech support is provided by Alara Stefania Gadet and Bill Lee. For those of you who are here for the first time or are still new to Westwood, I bid you a special welcome. We're glad you found us in this virtual space. In the future, we look forward to gathering together in our beautiful building and grounds. But until then, we share this particular space and time every Sunday morning as a continuing expression of our commitment and gratitude for our beloved community. If you have a candle or a chalice nearby and want to bring it forward, now's the time. We light our shared chalices this morning in the spirit of renewal, that being together gives us the ability to amplify our own light. Joseph Campbell said, the privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. We gather this morning to strengthen, to reinforce, to change and grow, to challenge one another. We gather because we know that we are better together than alone that we can do more for one another and for the world when our resources are rallied and aligned. Welcome into this place of creativity, consciousness, courage, and community. Every week during our Sunday service, we pause to reflect on and share our joys and concerns with one another. As the music plays, I invite you to share your joys and concerns in the chat.
As this is the last Sunday of February, we will play and sing while muted the happy birthday song. Please type the names of those celebrating birthdays this month into the chat. We also recognize and cherish the joys and concerns that remain in our hearts. Please join me in reciting the affirmation while remaining on mute. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. We invite you now to sing the affirmation. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. So what you see on the slide right now is the book cover to this book I'm going to hold up. Your Great Life, and it's written by Gemma Stone, a Calgary psychologist. Is design the first step of manifesting a better future? And what else might there be? So this morning, we're looking at the work of Calgary psychologist Gemma Stone and how it aligns with our own commitments. Her book, Your Great Life, is available for purchase online, or you can get the first three chapters electronically for free on her website, gemmastone.org, to see if it's for you before you invest. Now, here's the answer to the question. I won't leave you hanging. Is design the first step to manifesting a better future? It can be, and it's the work of a lifetime. It's not something that we do in one moment and then be done. Design is the act of being intentional, creating a blueprint for our lives and livelihoods, and not only as a first step, but as a continuous journey. So these are Gemma's words. Great lives are not super lives. They are truthful lives. Great lives are not without tears and heartbreak, uncertainty and confusion. They are not lived for approval, applause, or accolades. Great lives are born when you listen to your true self and let love light the way. Great lives are built from truth, integrity, courage, self-awareness, and vulnerability. Some of you may remember that I had the delight of joining Gemma for a workshop in Banff in October, 2019. It was a weekend event and I actually won the registration for that event, just had to cover my own lodging and Lori came with me and we had a wonderful time. But that workshop was pure delight. Now, Gemma typically does these workshops she calls your great life redesign and they run for a week and she runs them at the Banff Springs Hotel and she considers them luxury retreats. Some of the folks will stay there, some of the folks will camp and just come in during the day for the event. Um, but this was a weekend, a shorter version and part of a series. She had done, the first one was heal the past, the second was love the present and the one that I attended was light the future. I was able in that weekend to identify priorities, set some creative goals, and begin down a path that I find really nourishing and exciting. That was five months before the pandemic changed everything. And I can honestly say that the grounding I achieved in that weekend has been priceless for facing this complex time that we're in. So while I wanna tell you a little about Gemma and her work, I also wanna look at how it could be meaningful for us, not only as individuals, but as a community, as a faith tradition to look at design. 
Many of you have heard me speaking about the Confluence Lecture recently. The UU Ministers of Canada sponsor this lecture. Um, and it used to be annual, now it's biannual. It's tied to when we have the Canadian Unitarian Con um, Council Conference. This year, that's online. And so uh, everybody can attend from wherever they are. And the Confluence Lecture is a free offering. You do not have to be registered. I mean, you'll have to get the Zoom link, but you don't have to be registered to participate. But here's the magic is that you don't, we don't give the lecture live this year. The lecture is being released in advance in three bite-sized pieces that you can either watch on video or read in text or just listen, turn the video on and just listen, whatever suits you best, but in bite-sized pieces with an invitation to interact with the material between the bites. And working on this project has been an exercise in design, just as the book describes for the personal context, but instead focused on our future as a community of Unitarian Universalists. These tools are so valuable and align so beautifully with our UU ways of approaching the world. So let's go to the book and you'll understand quickly what I mean. These are Gemma's words again. Life design isn't always easy or effortless, though sometimes it can be. You may have hesitations, doubts, or uncertainties, and you may step into your great life with bold enthusiasm. No matter what, every step you take in the direction of a fuller, truer life brings you closer to what deeply matters. So when we decide to get a hold of our lives as individuals and as organizations, to be intentional about what it is that we want and how we'll make that happen, there are no guarantees that it will be easy. You've journeyed with me now for years on the path to this moment where on Wednesday, I get a new left knee. It's been an arduous journey and the work is far from over, but here we are today because of design. One of the things Gemma shared recently in her online community is how important it is not only to make a decision about something, but to actually make a commitment. Not just, I want a new knee, but rather, I will do what it takes to get a new knee. And the evidence shows that if we share those commitments, if we commit to someone beyond ourselves, if we commit publicly, we are far more likely to achieve those goals. Being in community means that we're surrounded by people who, if we let them, can hold our commitments for us. You have held this commitment for me. I also have a writing partner now who I bookend with every day. In the morning, we message what the plan is regarding writing. And in the evening, we report back. It's not perfect. And a lot of the time we come back and say, well, that took a lot longer than I expected. But when I, send the, when I sent the message, I'm not coming upstairs until the work is done, it worked. We build confidence. We learn that we can trust ourselves by sharing the confidence that others have in us. So thank you for your support all the way to getting to this knee. A part of me wasn't really sure it would ever happen. And it's feeling like a miracle today. Here's more from Gemma. Be prepared. Your ego will almost certain, certainly protest your new life. When you choose to live the great life your soul is calling for, you may notice some fears rising. I wish I could promise you that these fears will never see the light of day. However, life design is subject to the realness of life. As you embark upon living a life you love, please remember fear has a tendency to inflate itself. It likes to puff up into a sharp and prickly ball to keep, sorry, to scare you into staying stuck. Even if your fears do materialize exactly as you imagine, it won't necessarily mean you'll regret designing a life you love. The whispers of your soul are meaningful and trustworthy. You are much more likely to regret ignoring them than to be sorry for heeding their call. So let's talk about the difference between self-help and life design. In this work, Gemma 
is talking about the difference between what she calls our true self and our constructed self. Our true self is the self aligned with our values, our principles. This is the work we're doing here together, week after week, identifying what the Reverend Alice Blair Wesley calls our real and right loves and living a life in integrity with these. The constructed self emerges from a desire to get love as in maybe if I'm nice enough, smart enough, funny enough, obedient enough, rich enough, or pretty enough, they'll love me. Beginning in childhood and continuing as long as we need it, the constructed self takes what it has observed and experienced and learned and builds a mask to protect the vulnerable true self. Life design is about realigning ourselves with our true self, our core values and visions, and finding ways to live more fully into this reality. Where self-help is the practice of trying to be things, but not necessarily for those truer inner reasons. It may still be serving that constructed self or doing the things you think are the right things to do in the world or what somebody else thinks are the right things to do. That doesn't mean that self-help um, programs and projects might not help you manifest this truer self, but the core message that Gemma's trying to make is that the true self, the one aligned with your values, is where we're aiming. I have a story that may help illustrate this. When I was in high school, I started cutting hair. I'd cut my dad's hair, I'd cut my friend's hair, I'd muck around with the scissors anytime somebody wasn't looking. I loved cutting hair. And I thought I would really like to study hairdressing. And my dad said to me, there's no money in that. You're too smart for that. You could do anything. Don't waste your time doing that. My true self loved that it was creative, that it was hands-on, was excited doing this work. It, it, it triggered this thing I now call bounce. It would make me bounce. I was so happy doing this. What I understand now is also that it's because it's relational and creative. You're building relationship. It's a very intimate practice. My constructed self wanted to please my father. And my constructed self heard things that felt complimentary. You're smart. You can do anything. You're capable. Don't waste your time on this thing. So I didn't. He thought he was complimenting me. I was stuck in the place of not listening to my own voice. Years later, still feeling stuck, I realized that somewhere deep down inside of me was this desire still to go to hair school. No part of me wanted to be a stylist anymore. But I was stuck because I hadn't gone. Because it had been so important to me and I had not been able to find a way to let that go. To undo the betrayal I felt for not listening to that voice that was so strong. So in 1999-2000, I went to hairdressing school. And I worked for a little while in a salon. I helped support my family and my life for years doing hair at home. It's been very helpful surviving the pandemic. But what I needed was to tell my true self that I was listening, that I heard her, that what was important to her mattered to me as well. And now I know that these creative outlets, that creative outlets are what make me bounce, what make me sparkle. And when they're in relationship with other people, that's where the magic happens. And whether it was working in a coffee shop or bartending or doing hair for a living or this kind of ministry or any other kind of ministry, they're all connected. 
but I wasn't free to find this version of myself until I undid that stuck place and told myself I was listening. It is probably one of the, well, it's certainly one of the best choices I ever made. Our true identity is tied to values, principles, and vision. And our constructed identity is practical. That doesn't make it bad, but it's often fear-based. In your great life, there are four C's, the letter C, to life design. Creativity, consciousness, courage, and community. Creativity is the message that you are following your own plan. So while the book is full of stories of people uh, doing design in their own lives, and it's full of questions and worksheets and opportunities for you to figure out what it is that is at your core and what you want in life, what Gemma tells you over and over again is don't do what they did. Just hear their story. Do what you need to do. Here are her words again. Your great life is one part science and one part art. We're syncing up the left brain and the right brain in new ways. Lighting up neural networks in unfamiliar patterns can help you tap into your truth rather than the ancient pathways that you've been taught to use. Life design is a magically creative and profoundly practical process. Creativity puts us in an altered state and allows us to dynamically explore what is possible. Life design is about exploring possibility, gaining clarity and committed to a, committing to aligned action. Creativity is a conduit for your joy and self-awareness. Can you feel the parallels to Unitarian Universalism and what we do that we're looking for what is our, our true and right values and how to move towards them, how to always be moving towards them and that we use creative ways and intellectual ways blended together to do that. We're shifting our old choices from automatic neural pathways to intentional, consistent, the things that are consistent with the choices we want to make central. So I call these, I think you've probably heard me before, talk about the super highways in our brain, which are the paths we follow over and over again. When this happens, we respond this way because this is what we've been doing for a lifetime. And when we want to change a pattern and respond differently, now we're forging a brand new little baby goat trail in our brain. And the super highways call to us. And when we get on them, it's hard to get off of them. But the more you walk the goat trail, the deeper and wider it gets. Your super highways don't go away. That's the tricky bit. They're always there. It's easy to take a detour and land on them again. But so are your goat trails. And you can build them. That's the trick is to build them into the new super highway. Here's a point that really stood up for me. This, sorry, that was me slipping into the consciousness section, the neural pathways piece. I missed my own heading. Gemma has a quote that I just wanna lay here and leave it with you because this is a reminder I need over and over again. One of the easiest ways to avoid consciousness is to distract ourselves with to-dos. Damn. <laughs> we make ourselves busy and miss the point. The third C is courage. It's not necessarily easy, but typically regret is worse. And Marianne Rodmacher is quoted in the book saying, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the little voice at the end of the day that says, I'll try again tomorrow. One of the questions Gemma asks in this section is, what are you pretending not to know? What are you pretending not to know? And the fourth C is community. 
And here's the gem that we offer each other. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said, reminding one another of the dream that each of us aspires to may be enough to set each other free. It's not about becoming the same ever. It's about becoming ourselves together. That's what community building is about. Life design is a lot of self time. It's individualistic. You're using your own values and visions and purpose and you're self-reliant. You're counting on yourself to make the changes, to set the path, to do the work. But community gives us connection and belonging. And it gives us the ability to do so much more than we could do alone. Here's an interesting thing about community. Gemma talks about limbic resonance. The people, there's her words. The people in your community directly affect how much or how little you love your life. Whew, let's say that again. The people in your community directly affect how much or how little you love your life. The people you are in relationship with and surround yourself with will change your heart and mind. Simply put, who we are and who we become is deeply connected to the community we spend time in and the people we love. There is a whole section in this project called Ritual Your Own Way. And there's such a resonance with who we are as Unitarian Universalists, because this is our specialty. We take what is important and precious and valuable to us and build ritual that is meaningful, that isn't constrained by somebody else's idea or some external authority about what it ought to be or how it ought to be. We have recreated all of our rituals this year, moving them online or onto the front lawn at Westwood or into our homes, finding ways to light a chalice together, even when we're in our own little windows, finding ways to celebrate the flower communion, having our first ever or first in my time here, pet blessing. It's been refreshing in some ways to rethink things, to think about what's at the core, what's at the heart of that. The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker talks about what was the point you were trying to make when you created this ritual? Like a wedding now is not the same as a wedding 200 years ago. The purposes were different. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to create? And then how can we recreate it in a way that people can participate each in our own Zoom windows or from a distance or by mail or on the front lawn? And it's been hard. It's been hard to not be able to do the things that give us familiarity and comfort, to not be in the same space together, to not have the things we've come to count on. And so we've worked to try and build in loss and grief when we're doing these things, to acknowledge that it's not simple. It's never just good or just bad. It's all of so many things at once. And all of us have been paying attention to this at home. These are Gemma's words again, as well as in our shared space together. Living is a sacred act. Conscious living is an adventure. Life design is about choosing the sacred adventure over the well-worn path. Gemma talks about neural pathways and blueprints like I talk about goat trails and superhighways. And so here's just a really fun fact that shifted something inside of me when I learned it. There are various ways to describe the complex web of mystery called neural pathways. I call neural pathways blueprints, this is Gemma talking, because they show us how to build our lives. In order to build a life we love, we must design a great blueprint. A blueprint is a collection of beliefs, values, behaviors, preferences, patterns, and thoughts. 
Your senses, here's the fact, gather roughly 11 million bits of information per second. 11 million per second and send them to the brain for processing. But the conscious mind can only process about 50 bits per second. So you're getting 11 million and you're processing 50. What is processed and what is filtered depends largely on the blueprints that you are running in your mind. When you change your blueprints, you change your perception and you change your life. There's a tension created when you realize that there are parts of you that aren't being expressed fully or in the way you'd like to, that you aren't living your values the way you might want to when you do a check and a search. When we do as a community, a check and a search, and we say, well, this is really important to it, but how are we living it in the world? And you start to create a new blueprint for how you might do that. There is a tension that's created by seeing that where you are now and where you want to be, you're not there and there's work to get there and it's hard and it can be intimidating. But it's the tension that pushes you forward. We try so hard to avoid tension that we miss the motivator that pushes us forward. That's where the momentum comes from building some tension and some resonance. So Alice Blair Wesley, you've heard me speak from her before. This is a book called Our Covenant. It's from a series called The Men's Lectures in uh, 2000 and 2001. Alice writes, she's talking about the teachings of James Luther Adams. So these are both Unitarian ministers. James Luther Adams is one of our great theologians. And she's summarizing what he says in every course he ever taught, ever. Strong, effective, lively, lively liberal churches, sometimes capable of altering positively the direction of their whole society, will be those liberal churches whose lay members can say clearly, individually, and collectively, what are their own most important loyalties as church members. Note, not what are their beliefs, as in a creedal church, rather what are their shared mutual loyalties in a covenantal church. Liz James always talks about if you're going to try things and do new things, she likes to throw a million things against the wall and see which one sticks, like that old spaghetti test. She'll just try a bunch of things because she's failure friendly. But she always says that the things you're going to try, they need to be things that you believe in, things that get you excited. Because if they don't work out, at least you have had the exciting believed in experience of working with them. So that's, for me, the test is, does it have bounce factor? Does trying this thing make me excited and make me want to bounce? This is what I do when I get really happy. If it has bounce factor, even if it's not the destination we're going to end up in, the work was worth it. The lessons were worth it. The gifts were worth it. In this time of the pandemic, when we've had to try so many new things, do new things, not everything will stick. We will not stay exclusively online for the rest of our lives. Nobody wants to choose that. But so many good things have happened in this space. So many people have been able to join us. And we don't want to leave any of those people behind when we don't have to be exclusively in this space. So we will create a blueprint together. We will design together with our friends from a distance and our friends in person and figure out how to stay connected, how to live into these values of accessibility that we've always held and never been able to fully manifest. It's been such an exciting and painful and beautiful and complicated process. 
And that's what design always is. To close, I'm just going to read that Antoine de Saint-Exupéry uh, quote once again. Reminding one another of the dream that each of us aspires to may be enough to set each other free. May we be faithful companions on this journey to ourselves, to one another, and to the world. Blessed be and amen. Our final hymn this morning is Everything Possible, played by Jennifer. always makes me cry my little heart out. It was written in a more binary time, in a pre-poly time, uh, but it is written and often performed by the beloved Reverend Fred Small, who is a Unitarian Universalist minister, uh, now retired, but still singing. Living is a sacred act. Conscious living is an adventure. Life design is about choosing the sacred adventure over the well-worn path. May this be always the truth of what we do together and as individuals in our own lives. Blessed be and thank you for all your lovely, lovely, beautiful messages. I appreciate it so much.
then this is my last sort of public event. Uh, Monday's my last day following tying up loose ends and things. And then I will be away for two months. So I return the first Wednesday in May. There will be a coffee chat the first Wednesday in May. There will not be coffee chat in March and April. The calendar reflects that. And I'm just so grateful for all your encouragement and support. Thank you. <laughs>